when this plant germinated from one seed, first thing I do is make a little sprout with no leaves at all. I'm sorry, no thorns at all. I made a little, a little seedling with no thorns, just nice big green leaves like this. So I made the first four or five leaves as photosynthetic devices. And then the next leaf, suddenly the stipule of the leaf becomes this huge thorn that you see right here. So that, that, that is a modified stipule. So there's one pair of thorns for each leaf. And at that point, there's no ant colony of course. We just have the seedling with the thorn. Now, running around in the habitat here are queen ants looking for one of those little seedlings. And when she finds it, if she does, the green thorn, she goes and starts to cut a hole in the thorn. And when she gets in the side, she cleans the thorn out, lays her first eggs inside the thorn. So now we have a little colony just starting in this little seedling. But let's say that an ant queen did not find that thorn. Along comes a grasshopper, a mouse, a caterpillar. This is lettuce. These leaves have no chemical at all. So their defense is the ants. So here's a seedling with no different chemical defenses. So the first thing happens is wham, some herbivore takes everybody except the thorn. So now you get a little bonsai seedling. The little bonsai seedling grows another thorn, and another thorn, and another thorn. And if you look around, you start looking for them on the ground, you eventually find a little one about this tall with maybe 10 thorns. And no ant colony, because what's happened is the ant queen has not gotten started, or the colony never got started, so the tree's trying and trying. Finally, one queen makes it. She makes some worker ants, and they begin to patrol the surface. At that point, the tree grows like a wheat. So you put on a meter and a half of growth the first year that they get a colony. And it's done by the ants are protecting the leaves. So they're the chemical defense. They're the nicotine in the leaf. Okay? The thorn is the house, and the sugar that runs this operation is produced by little glands at the base of the leaf. They're little, little, uh, little domes, they look like little tiny volcanoes at the, at the base of each leaf. A tree this size, well, when this hill had a branch sticking up here like that before somebody cut it off, a tree this size would make about a teaspoonful of Cairo syrup a day out of those nectars. And the ants go around and religiously harvest that sugar. So that's their gasoline. They also feed some of that to the larvae, which are in the thorns. Now, one of these thorns, this big one over here, but there are some big ones down here. Uh, this was probably the queen thorn before. This, see this very large thorn? It's very distorted, large thorn. That was the thorn that probably had the queen in it for a long time. And the, the um, she produces eggs, she's an egg factory. And she makes eggs, and the workers carry the eggs out to the individual thorns. So these are brood chambers, if you like. And so there's larvae inside of each one of them. And the ants are taking nectar to the larvae and the belching bodies. And named after a guy named Thomas Belt, who first described this, a mining engineer in Nicaragua. His name is B-E-L-T, so they're called Belchin, but they're not, not in birth Belch, but in Belch, okay. There's a bunch of them that they have not yet harvested on this new leaf right here. And if you look down closely to the leaf, you'll see on the tips of each leaf lip, a little body. And it's very dark. And it's actually, if you look under a microscope, it's dark purple and orange. The purple dark are vitamins, carotenoids. The the um, content of the little food body is fat and protein and vitamins. I think about it. fat, protein, and vitamins on the tip of the leaf. Furthermore, the protein is animal protein. If you give that protein to a, a proteinologist, he will tell you this came out of an animal. The plant is making an insect mimic, which the ants harvest. That's their solid food. That's what they feed in the larvae inside the crop. So the, the cost of a ant colony is making thorns, making leaves with the Belgian bodies on them, and making nectar every day. Now, when the 
So we, we think thorns, nectaries, belcher bodies. But there's one more thing that's staring you in the face. This is the full dry season. In the middle of April, when it's just hot as hell, the soil may sit there with leaves on. That's the other cost. They maintain the ant colony year round by making nectar. Eventually, in the end of the dry season, they don't make new leaves anymore at all, but they make nectar. And that keeps the ant colony alive, so when the rains come and everybody's out there gobbling leaves, this guy stays perfect. So what you're doing is, it's set up for, and, and all its ancestors are desert plants. This come out of the desert, invading the forest. It's not a forest plant going out in the desert, it's a desert plant going into. And um, there are 14 species of these in Central America. And there are about 18 species of ants. This is the black one, it's called Flava, Pseudomyrmix flavicornis. And the red one you were seeing down there is uh, Pseudomyrmix uh, ferruginea. And the parasite is Pseudomyrmex nigropylosa. There's two species of parasites on these things. And um, these things, now we've got an ant colony who's also evolved. And the plant has evolved, this stuff. And the ants have evolved to be turned into full-time policemen. So if you're you know, a kid graduate student like I was, the first thing you do is, this is my, I'm describing my thesis research, the first thing you do is you go get some poor miserable insect and you put him on the, on the leaf and see what happens, right? So if it's somebody who isn't very agile and can jump off, the ants run up and get a hold of him, and what do they do? The first thing they do is walk over to the edge of the leaf and drop him off. Perfectly good piece of food thrown away. It's a, it's a, it's a policeman. Now, his response is patrolling, not foraging for food. The foraging of food is the Belgian bodies down here. So they've evolved the behavior of no longer being a predator. All their ancestors are predators. They aren't anymore. The second thing about them is they patrol three and they 24 hours a day. All their ancestors are diurnal. These guys are around the clock. It's come out at two o'clock in the morning and poke it and the ants come right out. They're all there walking up and down the stem. So that's the second thing about them. The third thing about them is that if the insect, your caterpillar, you put on here, doesn't jump away and they can't get a hold of him to pull him off and throw him away. He runs up, bites it and stings it and runs away. Another one comes up, bites it and stings it and runs away. Bites it and stings it. It's like a policeman sitting here shooting at the robber, but not catching the robber. So what it's doing is annoying the hell out of the insect. And eventually the insect leaves or dies because of the venom. Speaking of that, this one doesn't have one, but there was a remnant in the tree we were looking at back there of a wasp nest yeah. hanging up in the in the tree. Also, you see bird nests hanging in the trees. That's because the ants are really good defense against monkeys and snakes. When I was a graduate student and not understanding much of this thing, I caught vine snakes, which are very slender fakes and go and get nestling birds and that kind of stuff, and put them on ant occasion to see what happens. Well, the, the snake gets on here, the ants sting it, and it jumps off. Think, well, you see, nothing happened, just sort of chased it away. Put the snake in a cardboard box the next day, it's dead. You know, the venom is slow, slow to kill the snake, but it does. Okay. Um, and the, but the, the way the bird builds a nest in here is to go get a twig for the nest construction and stick it there. The ants pile on it, they sting it, and they bite it, and all that. Bird good gets another one, puts it there. Go gets another one, puts it there. Another one, another one. And by the time it's got 500 of them, or 1,000, which is the nest, the ants have been on it so much that the, the nest has acquired the odor of the colony. So it's become part of the colony now. And these ants have the very peculiar behavior. They go in and out of their little holes, but they don't go inside dark objects like a nest. So if you build a covered nest, the ants run all over the outside and never go inside. So the kids aren't bothered. And when they land on you, you discover the same thing. They don't go inside. They run around on the outside of you trying to bite and sting, but they don't go inside. There's one in Panama called Pseudomorphic satanica, which does go inside, and there are no bird nests in its trees. It's very, very striking to see that. It's all over Panama, and it's a big black one, and there's no bird nests in them. And it took me a long time to find out, and I realized when I was working with them, they would land on me and look for a spot like this and go inside and get me on the bare skin. Well, of course, that's lethal to a baby bird. And um, the other thing about the wasp nests that are here is they're protected from army ants. So the army ants are foraging and they take wasp nests out all the time. The, um, uh, the, um, uh, 
The wasp produces chemicals at the base of the nest where it joined the tree, which are repellent to the ants. So the ants come up to the nest and stop right at that, at that point. Um, and then finally there's a caterpillar who lives in the crowns of the tree, big caterpillar, lives in the crowns of the trees. Oh my God's name can it do that? It eats only anacacias. Mama comes along, she lands on a, tree, on a thing, she starts laying eggs. One egg, two eggs, three eggs, four eggs, and the ants pile on her. They start to bite and go through the hair that's all over her. By the time they get through her hair, she's laid six eggs, seven eggs, five eggs, four eggs. She flies, gone. She picked a tree that had a big ant colony deliberately. She lays those number of eggs deliberately because she's chased off. And that's the number of caterpillars it takes to defoliate that tree. So she's put on just the number of caterpillars that can be supported by one tree. If you take the ant colony off, as I did, she comes and she lands, she lays 35 eggs in one tree. And all the kids die of starvation. Because she doesn't have the behavioral response of stopping after four or five eggs if nobody attacks her. So what she does is seek out big aggressive colonies. It'll get on her right away. That's what she lays her eggs on. And then she goes off and lays another five eggs on another tree. So all, the, all these different pieces are all evolutionarily adapted to each one, each other. Um, what left? Oh yeah, the, the ants that are out here patrolling on the end out here towards the, where the new leaf is up here. Any ant you see running down here by definition will be the oldest ants in the colony. These are the toughest, most aggressive, most experienced ants are out here. And the dummies, the kids, well the real kids are inside taking care of the kids. And then when you get older, you start patrolling out in here. And finally the oldest, most aggressive ones are out here on the, on the shoot tip out here. And this tree, oh, I left out one last thing. This one you can't see anything because there's nothing growing in the vicinity. But if there were other green things, there would be a cylinder like this with nothing green in it. It looks like it's radiating chemicals. It's not. The ants are the chemicals. The ants go down to the ground and they find a seed of anything. They pick up the seed and they walk out here and they drop it. If a vine comes growing up here like this and finally touches this, within 24 hours that vine is dead. Because they pile on and they sting and they bite and they sting and they bite. What they do is they create a big hole in the forest for the sun to come through. And so these things have got leaves all the way down to ground level in, in this hole where everybody else is frantically going up, these guys are making a healthy ant colony which keeps it a bare space. Down at ground level and then right up like this. So if any twig reaches over and touches it, this thing had leaves on it and it touched that, this would be killed very shortly. And uh, so that's of course how they move from desert into vegetation. So that's, how, that's how they handle the competition. Finally, I guess the last thing to say about them in the big picture is that we think that when this was, you know, all primary forest, these would have just been in the tree falls or on the edges of uh, river banks and creek banks and that kind of stuff, landslide edges and so on, um, and uh, uh, very, very low density. When you come in and you clear for pastures and fields and that, you get jillions of these things growing along the edges of roads, edges of pastures and all that. What we're noticing in the conservation area here is they're going extinct. As we restore the forest here, these guys are dropping out getting fewer and fewer and fewer of them. And uh, there's here there are three species of aggressive ants. The black one, which is this one, which is I find mostly in areas that are very heavily exposed to lots of sun, lots of dryness. They are the most heat tolerant ones. Then the two brown ones, a small one and a slightly bigger one, are more in the shade. And the littlest one is deepest in the shade. And I think originally they would have been very distinctly separated when this is all primary forest. And you to find the, you know, the, the, the black one mostly on those very exposed hills and cliff faces and places like that, and the other ones more back tolerating more shade and, and, and more more inside. Now when you come in and you clear the whole area, you produce lots of anacacias. You got all of them mixed up all together. So you got three species of ants all doing the same thing, and they're aggressive as hell to each other. If you have, you, you can do this. This is one of these student projects. It's really gory. You have one here and one here. You get a bed sheet, put it on the ground here, and then pull these two branches together and tie them together like this. And you get to watch 3,000 ants kill 3,000 ants. Because they pile onto each other, and whoever's got the most ants wins. It's just, and then it takes over until you get one colony of both trees.
They'll do that to each other when they're growing too. They'll go across the ground like this, they discover another occasion to get a war here, and somebody takes over, queen's killed, and um, you end up with just a bigger food resource for that colony at the end of the day. And uh, there's acacias in East Africa with uh, round thorns and a ball-shaped thorn instead of this cattle horn like this. Completely independently evolved, but many of the same characteristics, but a different genus of ants called Chromatogaster. The same ancestors of these ants are in Africa, but they never invented an acacia ant. They invented a deep forest ant, which lives in a, in a tree called Barteria. And when I started working with them, I started in on them, just like I've been playing with these for years, and discovered that, that it's a big black one about that long. It's obviously made to make an elephant remember. They, they, they <laughs> land on you, and oh, there's an ant walking on my shoulder, you know, and you don't think much about it. And then finally you look down and suddenly, oh, he's stinging me, right? So you, you know, you flick him off. Next morning you wake up, you can't even move your arm. It, it just trashes the muscles all through this area. They're not paralyzed, but they just ache like you, you've just been hit with a baseball bat. And you get very wary of those trees very quickly. Whereas these are just like a honeybee and, you know, this is nothing, nothing big. But the African one, which is evolved from the same ancestor as this guy is, but they're for big mammals. And um, this guy here, uh, presumably, was defending, oh, cattle and horses won't touch them. And you want to be torture a sleeping horse? Huh. Get an aspirator as a little lung-powered vacuum cleaner and suck up a bunch of these ants. So now your aspirator is full of the alarm motors of the ants. And go over and blow it in the nostril of the sleeping horse. Oh. Jumps three feet off, oh. off the ground. Oh. And a cow will, will levitate off the ground. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they learn, I always say, when they're young and you know out there foraging in the dark and hit one of these trees, you learn really quickly what that odor means. And you don't go near them. So they, these become a pasture plague in Mexico. In fact, my very first paper, my very first paper was a paper for the Mexican government on how to get rid of anacacias from your pastures. <laughs> and, and it's real simple. It's funny, people go out there with a machete and cut the tree down and come back six months later and the tree and the pasture is full of young anacacias. If you cut it down and take the crown, which you know, off here and just put it over there, 20 meters, kills the colony because the dye's in the tree. But if you put it down here, this thing produces a stump sprout, and as soon as one stump sprout from the old tree land at the bottom, the whole colony moves in in the stump sprout, and you've got a beautifully protected young tree growing. Which was my thesis, if you want to know how this guy kind of stuff, where I did that to 5,000 trees, so that in different places, it's in the shade, in the sun, by rivers, and deep, you know, blah, 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 blah. And uh, the story's always the same. If you take the ant colony off by mechanically or by pesticides, it dies. And it dies from shade, and it dies from being eaten by everybody. And everybody can eat these things. Mice, caterpillars, grasshoppers, teddy ganeids, beetles, you name it. It's just, it's lettuce. This has got no, and when you do real chemistry measurement, there's almost no chemistry of these leaves. I mean, it's just food. But of course, that's what lettuce is. We've taken and bred the defensive chemicals out of the lettuce plant, and then what we put, we put them back. Remember salad dressing? <laughs> Salad dressing is just the defensive chemicals that are taken from different plants in different small amounts, put it all together, and you put it on lettuce, think it tastes wonderful. Well, you just made up your own defensive con concoction, which you think tastes nice. But probably you could kill a mouse with a, with a stomach full of any one of those chemicals. <laughs> Coffee's the same way, of course. So there we go. So there, like I say, this is, and this black, black one that's on here, as I said before, is a different species than the one that's, that's down there. And uh, this one, instantly, the black one is not very good at making big, nice, we call them.